Hi everyone, it's so nice to be here today and seeing so many names. I can't, we, we don't, I, I'm not seeing you, but I can see the names. So nice, very nice to be here among us friends um, and have Open Education Week. So, um, as Beck said, we are going, Viv and I are going to talk about a project we have been working on since last year. It's phase two of a uh, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion project. And this one is focusing in Latin America. And today we are going to present some of our planning, the project process and, 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 and some methods and also some preliminary findings. About this presentation, like I said, we will we will give an introduction, you know, the rationale uh, and why we are, uh, are engaged in this process, this project. Uh, we will talk about phase two, but also we will touch on phase one, just so then you can see some of the differences in, in, in findings, but also in the processes. Uh, a bit of the methodology, uh, some of the findings, uh, uh, recommendations and what has been placed already and we might get uh, uh, an update as well from colleagues from GoGN here uh, um, today. Now I go to three. Okay, so about this project, uh, uh, which is very similar from phase one in the sense that it is a GoGN project and supported by the Hewlett Foundation. Um, um, the rationale for this for the project, phase one and two, is that for GoGN as an open research community to be more diverse, equitable and inclusive. It's not that it is not. Uh, 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 we try our best, the team, you know, work uh, really hard in trying to uh, include, you know, as many people as possible. But uh, despite of all efforts, uh, it, the majority of our, our students uh, are, are still from developed countries. Uh, so we wanted to change a little bit that uh, um, uh, uh, and expand access to GoGN to other places. So um, um, one of the objectives is to incorporate perspectives, experiences of underrepresented communities and also develop uh, uh, further develop, because we have started in phase one, further develop the diversity, equity and inclusion guidelines for GoGN. And you will see that some things have been uh, uh, in place already. So phase one of the project, I'm just going to, to spend um, two minutes here uh, to give you a little bit of the background of that so you understand more where we are at at stage two. So phase one, was in Africa and I worked with Judith Petty uh, um, in that project. She conducted eight interviews there with experts in open education and then uh, um, there was the data was analyzed and we had a two full day workshop where we could then you know, present those preliminary findings to participants and also get, you know, further discussions on the issues we found uh, and also uh, collect uh, and validate data. Uh, and it was a good, really good experiences. From that, we had a paper we presented at PCF 9 uh, and it was a good good event to, uh, a good experience to collaborate with those experts in person because the interviews were done online. Um, this phase, like I said, informed the, get, the first draft of the guidelines for GoGN, but also informed much of the project, phase two of the project, which it was, it is still going on in, in Latin America. And that's what we are going to talk about now is give more information about phase two. We also had in phase two interviews, but we, we managed to get 12 uh, stakeholders from a whole range of countries. We had um, Mexico, Costa Rica, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Colombia. Have I missed anyone, Viv? <laughs> So it had a much more spread uh, um, a representation across uh, um, Latin America, which was very good. And, and Uruguay. Uh, Uruguay. Uh, 
Yes, you're going. With yes, that excellent. Um, thanks. So then we recorded those interviews. So we, trans uh, we sent it to be transcribed and we've ran the coding of the analysis of the preliminary analysis um, and which we are going to present here today. Instead of a two day, because of COVID, obviously, we had to make adjustments to the project. And, you know, instead of the two full day workshop we had planned, we were going to have an online, a half a day uh, um, online workshop instead with, with uh, um, OEI experts. Due to the technology, you can't really expect people to sit for two days in front of their computers. So um, we had to adjust, but we have a very good, a positive uh, interest for the workshop, which is higher than what we had before. So in that sense, it might be uh, uh, easy for us to then get um, participants involved uh, in that um, workshop. And it will be the same, we will use to further get the information, uh, uh, validate what we found, you know, and, and solidify also our relationships and, and uh, with colleagues there. And the dissemination of the project is already happening. So we were at OE Global last year, Viv and I, we have a blog post, the links are at the uh, last slide of this, and we can also share with you guys here in the in the chat. So we have a post, a blog post about the project with these findings, and they are in Portuguese, in Spanish, and English. So, which is very good. Thanks, Paco and Vivian, for the translation. <laughs> right. Okay. So we will start now presenting some of the findings, but what we found is that it would be interesting if we share, you know, phase one and phase two, what, what we found in Africa and what we found, you know, in the Latin America, uh, 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 talking with Latin American uh, uh, experts. One of the things we asked them was, uh, uh, about the definitions, about their perceptions of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, because it is important to understand so we can we can then address or or, or, or discuss and, and 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 debate those those definitions. Um, in phase one, when we talked about diversity and we asked participants to you know express their uh, ideas and perceptions of diversity, in phase one in Africa. Uh, uh, the majority of them include considered that you know uh, uh, um, diversity uh, should consider, but not be limited to culture, race, ability, health, criminal records, class, and appearance. They also uh, uh, think that uh, diversity should acknowledge the range of context underpinning diversity and the limitations of people's understanding of it in order to uh, take appropriate actions. When we ask Latin American uh, colleagues then to express their uh, understanding of diversity, we got some similarities there, but also uh, uh, multidisciplinary, so they believe that includes, you know, diversity is multidisciplinary, that it is a, 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 a variety of experience should be considered. Uh, and it also must have a diversity of language uh, uh, and representation. You will see the language comes in, 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 in a different definition uh, in phase one, because some of those elements, some of those concepts really overlap. So then, equity. So in phase one, when we talked about, when we asked participants about their experience or definitions and perceptions uh, uh, about equity, in phase one, colleagues mentioned that uh, uh, it was about removing barriers to access. It was about including language and research practices. It was about equal opportunities and about and also about uh, acknowledging that there are different needs and that equity must be a continuing process because this need can change over time. Uh, phase two in, in Latin America, 
candidates, uh, candidates, no, participants said that it was about social justice, that equity is about equal opportunities, which is something that came up before. It was also about capacity building and awareness raising so that, you know, they are, they are aware of, uh, of the issues around open education in this case. And it's also about the equitable distribution of resources and the different types of resources as well uh, 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 in different languages. So this next one, it is about inclusion. So again, we, we asked similar questions uh, to these both groups in phase one and phase two. And in phase one in, in Africa, candidates understood that uh, inclusion was about taking into consideration other people's views and opinions. It was about uh, who and what should be included or excluded uh, and why. In the, co in the context, for example, of GoGN, we, if you would develop a guideline, uh, uh, you know, we, we would like to be inclusive, but we can't include people outside of the context that it is GoGN. So that was the issue they discussed. Um, and it's also about involve the marginalized and unheard voices. In Latin America, then participants uh, uh, said that inclusion is about participation, integration, collaboration, and it's also about feeling valued. So experiences are counted and considered. Okay, so these were again, for those who are coming in now, uh, um, uh, data that was collected in phase one and phase two, and we just put it here so you can see that there are similarities, but also one implement the other. Also overlap because what some candidates said, you know, uh, that was their understanding of, uh, um, for example, uh, diversity was then included in equity in another in another setting in another in in phase two. Right. So now. We also would like to hear, we would like to, sorry, wrong. We would like to include you guys in this discussion. We have here today with us people all over the world from different places in the world. And we would like you to join our discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. So if you could, or then, um, uh, write in the chat box or also make a comment. We would like to know how diversity, equity, and inclusiveness is applicable in your context. And because it is open education context, let's put in the context of open education in your country. So we would like to hear any ideas, any contributions that you would like to make to the findings so far, but also, you know, if we would like to to give us your perspective. Oh yes, everyone should be able to use the microphone. So if you can unmute yourself and make a contribution, that would be great. No? Can I? put anyone on spot to hear. <laughs> no? We can move to the next one then, to the next question. Perhaps instead of, you know, uh, having a discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusiveness in your context, on the context of uh, uh, open education in your country, Maybe we could have a discussion about what is the role of GoGN network uh, and, and what is uh, the, the role that it plays in enabling uh, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion. What do you guys think? Well, so <laughs> from, the, from the wide northern hemisphere perspective, I think it's finding ways to make sure we explicitly include diverse voices. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, 
<laughs> like you're white. <laughs> uh, not to say that um, Northern Hemisphere is, is predominantly uh, populated by white people, right? <laughs> And Leo says, I would say GoGem plays a really vital role in the broader open education movement and highlighting the international diversity and differences. I, I super agree with you, Leo. Um, but if you think about today in terms of, um, you know, the, the diverse population that uh, belongs to the GoGen, um, most of the, most of our members are from the global north or from english speaking countries so for example in latin america um there's just me in virginia who belong to the network and represent a very small uh portion uh but i do agree with you so uh, that's just something something to get you guys thinking uh you know why this, this happens right um yeah it can always be increased and, and i think that that's one of the main objectives of um this whole study mm. is to increase um this participation and become more diverse uh because otherwise gogen is always going to be this hub where you know you have people from uh the northern hemisphere participating, those who speak English and not diverse and accessible to everybody everywhere. Mm. And one thing that I have uh, discussed with colleagues in Gojian as well and with Viv is that we tend, we tend to, but also because of the access we have, you see, we tend to preach the already converted colleagues, so where we go to present, uh, uh, you know, at OER, um, OE Global and other conferences, OER 21, which we are going as well. So it's uh, people do understand that, but we found in the findings that, that Vivi will, will present now, you will find that if you go uh, outside that, that network, outside that uh, uh, net, uh, that not a lot of people really understand what we do. Not a lot of people understand even open education. And some of them, and we will get into more detail, have never heard of GoGN. So how can we, how can we help those and enable this diversity? You know, and create more opportunities for other. And it's not because there aren't, there isn't researching open education happening. It's only because people are not aware. Um, so how do we get how do we get those people engaged and involved? What it is it to take that for them to is that the language then that is stopping them from engaging with us? Um, and you will see here, even here, even here today, people making contribution are those mostly um, native English speakers. Would would and that's a reflection I'm I'm making now as a researcher. If we had these slides in Spanish, would encourage, or if we had part of the delivery done in Spanish, would help other colleagues making contributions here in this webinar, for example, because we have colleagues from Uruguay and other places in Mexico and other places in Latin America. Would that help if we had a different uh, uh, approach or way to deliver or even slides in uh, 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 words in Spanish in this slide. Um, yeah, so Luis has raised an important point. Um, Luis is, is a very helpful and active member, uh, participant in this study from Mexico. Um, he points out that it gives us the opportunity to opportunities to know that there are a lot of opportunities of growing at different ways of academic context. Uh, yeah, and for sure, because this is another really important channel 
uh, being able to uh, show your academic uh, work um, to the global north and internationally to other countries. And Marjan asks, is it possible to get in touch with schools in Global South that have graduate schools on education? Uh, well, I'm not going to answer directly that question right now because this is part of the findings. Um, yes, but that would be ideal uh, since there are, there are, most of the participants of the study uh, had never heard about GoGen before. Mm. It, it would be very important for us uh, to be able to do that here uh, mm. so that they could be included in the network. And Igor says, from open education global's perspective, we are a global organization with diverse membership and activities. As an internal team, we also work across multiple countries, time zones, language. For the next year or so, we will work on internal. An internal, yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, two, because we believe that our commitment to must start with internal work to drive yeah, that's, that's very, um, that would be very important, uh, Igor. I think um, the more that you um, establish these kind of, uh, you know, multiple country organizations and you involve more people, uh, I think a strategy is important for that. Mm -hmm. And good luck with that work. Very interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of organizations are looking at um, um, of DEI or other acronyms. They have EDI, uh, but really is about equity, diversity, and inclusion. So keep us keep us posted, Igor, and we will keep you posted as well with our findings and and, and guidelines. That's really good. Yeah, maybe we can we can you know bar from each other um, and and add uh, whatever you do find out and whatever data that we come up with and share this um, to get more people engaged. Mm. Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. I'm going to share here in the chat um, just uh, uh, the the blog posts that were. I'm going that uh, uh, um, that it's fresh from the press. <laughs> Thanks back for helping us publishing this. Um, we have in English and Portuguese and in Spanish. So um, Igor, that's that's an update on the project and some of the findings there um, in written format. Okay, so I guess my any more questions? Or comments. Or comments, suggestions. Okay, my lovely. It's with you now, Viv. Okay, so we're moving on. Okay, to the next. Um, and here I'm going to provide you with a very brief overview of the open education in Latin America. And um, Latin America, uh, I would still, I, I would say, is still at its early stages of adopting and implementing open education. But it has, during the past years, um, uh, this movement has been increasingly um, growing and increasing um, in most countries in Latin America in some countries more than in others. Um, and uh, you can basically, if you look at the OER map, you can see that there are several ongoing existing initiatives. Um, I can speak to the initiatives here in Brazil. We certainly do have many initiatives here um, in Mexico as well, as Luis um, uh, informed me. Uh, so, in some countries in Latin America, there are more initiatives. In other countries, uh, there are less initiatives. So, but yes, um, and the Latin American countries, they do get together and 
participate in local conferences. Uh, so, and then they exchange ideas um, and it's a very rich exchange. Um, the data, and this I found while, while I was writing my um, doctoral thesis and, and all kinds of other studies uh, here in Brazil and, and in other Latin America countries show uh, that there is a very high use and practices of digital resources. So remixing, uh, for example, educational materials is, is a practice uh, that is widely adopted. Uh, however, okay, and that is one of the main challenges, uh, there are still many barriers, okay? So it's, you know, not just remixing, but uh, a lot of people in the open education, and that includes teachers and, and other stakeholders, uh, they don't know anything about open licenses. Um, there are not always in all the countries uh, policies or any kind of funding for policies. Um, there is basically a lack of country champions. So for example, uh, from what I could uh, gather only Brazil and Chile have country champions, uh, but not all the other Latin American countries have champions. Uh, and there is basically um, a lack of awareness raising and capacity building uh, for open education uh, implementation and use. Uh, so we have a lot of work still to do. Uh, so that open education, OER, uh, can be something mainstream here in Latin America. Um, another challenge is that the countries in Latin America, they have different approaches to funding uh, basic and higher education. And ultimately, uh, this ends up impacting uh, open education policies. Uh, so, for example, um, Brazil uh, managed to um, establish a policy for basic education. And quite interesting, uh, I was looking for this because I, I wrote a paper for UNESCO on um, OER and open education here in Brazil. Uh, was it last year? No, the year before, 2019. And um, it, it, it had been published. And then I went to look for this policy again, and I just couldn't find it. And I don't know if our current government did away with this policy or not. Uh, uh, we have we've had a change in the Minister of Education. So I'm not going to say that this policy does not exist anymore. Uh, but Brazil was actually one of the first countries uh, in Latin America to implement uh, a policy that addresses the use of open education, no we are, in uh, basic education. And, uh, and along with that, uh, Brazil also uh, started a whole program uh, with the Open University of Brasilia uh, to build capacity for teachers and we have today what we call ambassadors uh, for OER. So it's, it's very interesting because these ambassadors are basically in charge of going around and, and teaching other teachers uh, about open education and OER. Uh, but this is still a, a great challenge. Um, each country basically uh you know funds uh has a funding or a policy some countries don't have any policies um i always remember this that my supervisor um rory uh Maguire, as as you almost know uh used to say this you know having a policy is not really important if if you're you know doing the practice uh so that always came to my mind, really, how important is it to have a formal policy, you know, to implement and use open education, now we are. Uh, 
another challenge that uh, Latin America has uh, is that they need to find ways uh, to showcase uh, more efficiently their open education OER initiatives to the global north. Um, okay, Leo says, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, great. Uh, so, in other words, okay, uh, they need to make their initiatives. Uh, there is a sense of a necessity uh, to make these initiatives more visible to the Global North so that the Global North can see uh, that there are many things going on here in Latin America which the Global North is unaware of. And also, um, this could be um, attained, uh, we could be providing support uh, via the use of resources and tools and research uh, via the participation in the GoGen. Um, these could also be great assets in helping um, the Global South uh, make their initiatives more visible, make their research more visible. Um, so this is a very brief overview of Open Education Latin America. So, Moving on here. I guess the next slide. Um, well, uh, from phase two, uh, we extracted an ex excerpt um, which basically defines uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusiveness in phase two. And one of the participants answered that a uh, diverse, equitable, inclusive community is one where the rights of each person are respected, opportunities for growth are equal for all, but also adaptable to the needs and capabilities of the individual. That is, the community understood that an essential part of society is aware that individuals have different characteristics and needs and opportunities for growth shall be accessible to all. Uh, so I think basically what it comes down to is understanding um, the many uh, diverse cultural and social aspects of other people. Um, so I think that this excerpt kind of portrays this is that um, if the global north is, you know, focused on, you know, the global north culture and does not see what the global south culture is like, uh, it becomes very difficult to be diverse, equitable, and inclusive. So, uh, moving on here to the preliminary findings. And um, it was, there was really a lot of data, so this is kind of condensed. Um, and I think now when we have the online workshop, uh, we will certainly validate this data and come back with more data. Uh, but one thing um, that really came up, and Karina has mentioned this before, is that not all participants were aware of the GoGen network. Uh, so basically, when I talk to maybe three people out of 12, okay, uh, they knew about the GoGen network, and the rest of them did not. So they were, so I did explain uh, during the interviews uh, what the GoGen network was about. Um, another thing that came up, and I think it's a finding that is very important, and that is why now we are working hard at translating uh, all our blogs, and we hope to translate uh, future studies that are released by GoGen, and so on and so forth, is that the lack of language diversity can be a barrier to expand the open education movement in Latin America. And that's because uh, resources are predominantly in English. Uh, so we cannot assume that everybody 
uh, speaks English fluently. For example, I received um, responses from participants uh, who did not feel comfortable answering uh, an interview in English, so they sent me uh, their answers in Portuguese and then I translated them. And I think that we should be open to that kind of thing. Um, so this is um, part of the data of the preliminary findings. Um, another important finding was that um, additional funding, infrastructure, and capacity building are, requ are required to foster uh, a DEI community in open education in Latin America. Um, you know, it's interesting when you go and talk to participants, um, they say, okay, great, um, yeah, we really need to get this thing going, but there is very few funding. There's very little funding. Um, and there is very little infrastructure. And although, um, you know, capacity building is something that is being increased and worked on, for example, here in Brazil, um, you know, there's just this overall complaint about the lack of funding. Um, so most of, most of the funding is, you know, basically concentrated in, in the global north. And when it comes to global uh, south, uh, specifically Latin America, uh, developing countries, uh, they always run across this challenge of, of funding and infrastructure as well. Um, another uh, preliminary finding is that Latin America needs more researchers in open education to expand the movement in the region and to give voice to the global south. And this is not to say that there, are, there has not been any research here from Latin America. Uh, there has been. Uh, but a lot of the research which is published is published in, lo in the local language. So it's either published in Portuguese or in Spanish. And, um, and then what happens is many times this research is not read by the Global North. So there is a lot of research going on here, and I think there is a tendency for this research to increase. Uh, more people are getting uh, interested, uh, but uh, for sure, uh, it would be good to have more researchers participating in the GoGen network and so they would be able to give this voice to the global south. Um, well, and also as a preliminary uh, data, uh, the stakeholders suggested strategies and recommendations to develop effective ways of communicating open research activities in Latin America. And they really came up with um, some excellent strategies. And I just read here, somebody said about ambassadors, yes, and th this is one of the ideas that they came up with, and which would be very interesting uh, to be able to expand the GoGen network. So, moving on. Um, so the key recommendations from uh, Central and Latin America uh, actually, we did have a participant from Costa Rica, so that's why Central America uh, has been included there, uh, were, or are, to develop further partnerships with Latin American universities to enhance GoGen visibility and reach. Uh, so I think this, this is uh, an excellent recommendation. Uh, to establish a clear objective communication and identity for the Latin America uh, community. So we have to take that in consideration too. Uh, when, and that is why the efforts now of posting in three different languages uh, and understanding the Latin American people as a people with their particular um, 
cultural and identity is very important. Uh, development of conferences, workshops, or seminars to build capacity in open education, including translation of content into Spanish and Portuguese. And I'm very happy uh, that we have begun to do that. And I think that will immediately attract more people um, to the network. And finally, to provide small research grants to disadvantaged students from the Global South. Um, and, well, the GoGen Network does already um, do that uh, in the sense that it provides fellowships and uh, grants uh, for GoGen alumni to participate in conferences and so on and so forth. But, for example, what happens if uh, one of the participants does not feel confident about her or his uh, English language speaking abilities to present or to be, you know, to participate in a GoGen uh, webinar and then at an old uh, open education global conference? Um, so I had a very interesting experience with that, um, with Virginia, for example, from Uruguay. Uh, because we were together at a GoGen seminar in OE Global to, uh, 2018, I think. Um, and uh, she had basically, she, she can't get by in her English, but she doesn't feel quite confident. And she had Bia, who at that time was the head helper. And it, it, it was very interesting. I think it was, it was a nice help. So we should kind of start thinking of how we include uh, these researchers. Yeah, we, we have so many, a, a great discussion happening here in the chat box. So um, this is slide, the next slide here is about, you know, some of the things uh, that GoGN has already committed to. And obviously, you can see now that things are being translated and Beck was work, has been working on, on this uh, as well before. So, uh, um, so some of the things we are already committed are that to inform members that diversity, equity and inclusion guidelines are in operation. So it's, there is a draft and will be further informed uh, by this study. I'm just going to hop very quickly through this slide because I want to get into the discussion in the chat box. <laughs> um, and and also, obviously, uh, and the resources will be available. So we will share these slides and you will see. And, 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 and also, it's a, a work in progress, this one, because you will see that, you know, we will, we will uh, um, um, add it to those as we work on the second draft of the guidelines. Um, uh, the other one is to create an environment in which individual uh, unique experiences and contributions are recognized and valued, to create an open research community that promotes dignity and respect for everyone, uh, 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 in respect of sex, race, disability, religion. So there is, there is a, a really good uh, vision and, and, and direction there. Another one is to make uh, available open research capacity building and development opportunities to disadvantaged students from Global South and to regularly review all GOGI and open practices and procedures so that fairness, diversity, equity and inclusion are held at all costs. And on top of that, the practi practical elements of it is already happening with us uh, uh, translating uh, documents, presentations and, and, and increase access to those things to people from different languages. So I, if that's okay with you, Viv, we could start with Igor as first question about the participants because we also got here and I've, I've been collecting <laughs> for us some resources that our participants here participants in the webinar sharing with us great resources um but Igor talked about and asked about the stakeholders um if we could talk a little bit more uh, about them and who they are and how we found those yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I was just going to, I was looking at the questions now because while I was speaking, I wasn't really paying attention to the questions. No, I, uh, I wasn't on, on, in the chat box for us. 
uh, but uh, yeah, eager. Uh, I cannot give you any names, of course. Uh, but what 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 we did basically was uh, we resorted to the OER map um, to find uh, champions, and of course, I know many people here in Brazil uh, that already do work with open education mm. and OER. Um, and then we had other uh, people um, come um, that I didn't know of before, but that I found from the map. And, and so these are people that already have been active in open education. Uh, they are open education experts in, in each of the Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Yeah, Martin has also suggested a few names where we then followed up and then if it wasn't available, that person wasn't available, there would be, you know, a recommendation of others to get in touch. But um, it was um, interesting to see and find out, willing also to make a contribution, like Viv said, they are um, experts and, you know, busy people and that they were uh, uh, willing to to uh, participate. Thanks, Viv, for working different time zones as well, because Latin America is such a big place. <laughs> so we had to work the different time zones there to talk to them. Yeah, and uh, now for the online uh, workshop, we have already five participants uh, confirmed. Uh, these are participants who already participated in, in, let's say, the first phase of our project. Uh, unfortunately, we were going to have face-to-face uh, -face, uh, workshops, um, one in London, then one in Sao Paulo, and then one in Taiwan. And because of the pandemic, um, everything was canceled. But we already do have five participants, and uh, and so they are all OE open education experts. Uh, they're very renowned um, in their in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, then Gustavo mentioned in your guy we have more uh, than ten years the same ball plan for primary and se uh, secondary education and the pro. Yes, Gustavo, I'm aware of that um, because. Um, I did uh, interview a participant from Uruguay, uh, who is also a very active member and OEA open education expert uh, from Uruguay. And um, what else? And he I suggested that we could have a, a GoGN ambassador or champion in the Latin American countries. That's a very good idea. Uh, um, if we could, you know, have a representative, even if it is in, not in each country, but if there would be, you know, a small, small group of um, colleagues that would do what Vivian was suggesting, you know, what, what Bear did for Virginia or, you know, just give their, um, they had, had also, um, understanding of English that could help the, the student or the PhD student to get engaged and, and uh, with GoGN uh, uh, activities and also with open education research that would certainly um, be of benefit. So, yeah, thanks for that, Gustavo. Uh, yeah, and um... What else? Were there any questions? Uh, the others can also learn Spanish. At least read research as we do with other languages. Uh, yeah, you know, I I really think, of course, Portuguese is kind of a language that is only spoken uh, here in Brazil and in, in Portugal and in Angola. So it's not, uh, let's say, language that's spoken uh, all around in the world, but. Yeah, we understand Spanish too. Uh, of course, we don't know how to write in Spanish. Uh, I could not post, for example, what Paco posted in Spanish. But Spanish uh, is spoken all over. So I think um, helping these researchers 
uh, with the translation. And of course, this involves funding. It's not easy to translate. Uh, I've, I've already worked as a translator, interpreter translator, um, way back before I ever got into uh, distance education. And uh, Ada, that's good. You understand Portuguese. Well, <laughs> That, yes. is that, that, that is excellent. Um, uh, so I think the more we can really, um, you know, have things translated into different languages, it's helpful. And Gustavo says, the ambassadors who can spread the word about the issue. English, not so much a problem. Although I think that in webinars, everybody should be able to express themselves in their mother tongue. Yeah, well, that's the problem. Uh, because, for example, uh, we would love to have webinars with, uh, you know, people speaking their mother tongue in Spanish or in Portuguese. Uh, but then what would happen with the rest? So either we have like simultaneous translation or not. So these are things that we have to think about. Yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. It's, it's not so easy. So we've had some good resources shared by Igor and Ada uh, about some initiatives and Gustavo. Igor has another one that he's um, shared with us. I didn't know about um, Igor, about um, Oi Latan, Tam, Tam. Yeah, I, I had heard about Oi Latan. Um, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going to study this initiative a little bit more in depth to understand. Yeah, me too. Uh, so thanks for that resource, Igor. And he's provided another one here. Uh, yeah. Oh, Marcelo, yeah. Uh, the person to speak to is Marcela Morales. Uh, she's from where, Igor? From Spain? Mexico. Oh, okay. Excellent. So maybe we can uh, reach out to her. If you can send us her email, maybe we can invite her to participate um, in our for forthcoming uh, online workshop, but operating from the U.S. at the moment. Uh -huh. So, Beck, are we going to have access to the texts here in the text box? Because um, some of the things I wasn't able to cut and paste. So, I'm just relying on the links. That's fine. Yeah, I can take a copy of the chat. No worries. Oh, excellent. I'm just asking. So, I said, okay, it would be good to, <laughs> to ask, but very good. Lovely. Thanks. Um, lovely. More, more, more things are coming. So this, this is really good. Yeah, the webinar. Uh, this is from Louise from Mexico. Implementation of an OER production course in both Mexico and Venezuela. Excellent. Um, my goodness, I can't even write. The Open Education Week uh, Global <laughs> One. Oh, thank you, Luis. Uh, I will make sure to try to participate. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Luis. Oh, muchas gracias, Igor. Muchas gracias. Yeah. So yeah. Igor. So we 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 finished, but the discuss and here's uh, again are the the links to uh, the 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 blog. But I really want to say thank you to everyone there for joining us today, uh, and for the contributions because I feel like it was a sharing experience, <laughs> as always it is. So, um, 
yeah now it's really good resources we got but very nice to share and get your uh, uh feedback on this as well so really good yes I, I would also like to thank everybody uh for sharing with us and for being here today and we have a lot to learn from each other so thank you very much Thank you so much, Karina and Viv. Um, that was fantastic. And I'm um, looking forward to hearing um, uh, about how the workshop goes and um, continuing the discussion going forward. Thanks mm -hmm. to everyone for the fantastic discussion as well in the chat.